pray as we get into God's Word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your Word. It is the truth. We receive your Word written in our heart, written in our mind, and we thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it. We thank you for all that you bring forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you a series of messages on the subject of redemption, the plan of redemption. We talked about how God has redeemed us. We talked about what Jesus accomplished from the cross to the throne. We talked about how he is the one who has liberated, we talked about the chronology of the last week of Jesus and how he's brought us into relationship with him. And we are going to talk today about the high priestly ministry of Jesus, the present ministry of Jesus. Now that Jesus has accomplished the redemption, we need to understand what he's doing. He is the one who is the high priest now, the covenant, as you will see. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. When it says sundry times, this means by many times and in many ways. Many times and many ways he has spoken to us in the past by the prophets. But it's a new day, because now we've come into the new covenant. Half in these last days, and this speaks of the church age, spoken unto us by his Son, because now Jesus is the Lord. He is the head of the church. And he is the one who is speaking to us through the New Testament, through his commandments, through the word of God, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. The world actually means ages. It's the Greek word aeon, which means the ages. He's the one who made the different ages that there are. Now, as we have these ages, now this is the church age. Jesus is the one who rules as the one, the Lord, over it. And he is the high priest of this new covenant. It goes on in verse 3 saying, Who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image, the express image of his person, he was the, as it says, the brightness. This means like a reflected brightness. A reflected brightness. And also the express image of his person, meaning that he's the exact reproduction of him, the exact representative of the Father. He brings forth this revelation. And he's upholding, which means to bringing forth all things by the spoken word, this is the word rhema, of his power, when he had by himself, he purged, he cleansed our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus accomplished the great redemption. And remember, he was the first one who was born from the dead. It says, verse 4, being so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Remember, he got this by inheritance because Jesus died and then he got a brand new spirit being born from the dead a brand new Jesus on the inside. Now he is the one who is the heir of the will that he made. And remember, it's a new person that came up. It couldn't be the same person in order to be an heir. Now he, by inheritance, has obtained a more excellent name than they. He got the name above every name. And unto which of the angels said at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. How did Jesus come back from being in hell for three days and three nights? He was born. This word means be born. And again, I, I, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When it says again, this word, when you look this up, it means back again into the same position he was in before. He brought him back into that position of God being the father and him being the son. And then he goes on in verse 6, and it says again, when he bringeth in the first begotten, the firstborn, Jesus came back into this it says world, but this word here means the inhabited earth. He came up from hell back into the inhabited earth, having been born again. He said, let all the angels of God worship him. So Jesus now is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Verse 7, and of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But then in verse 8, here's the Father speaking to the Son. And he says, Unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Here's where Jesus has been enthroned as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. He now rules in the kingdom according to the way of righteousness. 
Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. The word iniquity is the word anomia, which means lawlessness. Young's literal brings out what it means. He loved righteousness. He hates lawlessness. Therefore, God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And he now is on the throne, ruling and reigning as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We see over in Hebrews chapter 8, it speaks of what now he is doing. It says in verse 1, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So we saw he was enthroned, and he's at the right hand of the Father on the, thr of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Notice he is a high priest, so he's functioning on the throne at the right hand of the Father on his throne. He has a throne to rule and to reign, and he functions as the high priest. A minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle. There's a true tabernacle in heaven. The one that Moses made was simply a replica of what he was shown after the pattern of what was in heaven, which the Lord pitched and not man. Every high priest ordained to offer gifts and sacrifice, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve into the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the, tab make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, thou wilt make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. The Old Testament, again, was simply made after the pattern of what he saw. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. How much also, by how much also, he's the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. He has a more excellent ministry as the high priest. And he's now the mediator of the better covenant. We have a better covenant we've come into. Jesus brought forth the New Testament, the new covenant. And when it says it was established upon, this is a Greek word, nomotheteo, which refers to laws enacted or laws prescribed. Otherwise, there are laws of this covenant. It is the law of Christ. We are under law, but it's the New Testament law. The better covenant, which was an, had enacted laws or prescribed laws upon better promises. There's better promises that will come to pass in the new covenant. Now, it speaks of Jesus now on the throne as the high priest. Well, how did he become a high priest? First P, uh, Peter, cha excuse me, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. Hebrews 5, verse 5. It says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. He didn't decide to make himself a high priest at all. He didn't have anything to do with it. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. How do you come into the priesthood? You have to be born into the priesthood. In the Old Testament, it was only the tribe of Levi. Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. You have to be born to be a priest, though, into that particular means to come into it. So he could not be a priest under the Old Testament. But nonetheless, he says that he was born. Now, how did this happen? Verse 6, As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So now he's speaking the fact that he has been born as a priest, but this is talking about something different. This is not after the Old Testament order, which was the order of Levi. Instead, this is the order of Melchizedek. Now, we also see Verse 10, it says it again, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That means there's been a change in the priesthood. Just as there's a change in the covenant, there's a change in the priesthood. Now, what about this Melchizedek? Hebrews 7, verse 1. But this Melchizedek, king of Salem, and he was a king, priest of the Most High, God. He was a king and a priest. In the Old Testament, Oh, they could only be a king, or they could be a priest, but they couldn't be both. But now in the New Testament, this is different. The order of Melchizedek is one who was not only a king, but also a priest at the same time. So, we see now that Jesus is the one who is the king and the priest. And he is now over the church which he founded, which is the church of the firstborn. 
Hebrews 10, 21 says, Having an high priest over the house of God. Who's the house of God? You and I are. There's a corporate house of which Jesus is the cornerstone. You and I are living stones in the spiritual house of God. And Jesus now is in this position as the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the high priest sitting on the throne over the house of God, over the church. Now, going back to talking about this covenant, Hebrews 8, verse 7. The reason why the second covenant had to come into being is because the first covenant had fault. It was not what God intended. It was made between God and a man who could fail, who couldn't keep it. But the new covenant was made between God the Father and the man, Christ Jesus, who could keep it. And it's a perfect covenant, and it's one that would be a, a better promises and would also bring forth what God purposed, which was reconciliation unto the Father, which comes forth by being born. And how do you get into, how do you come back into reconciliation with the Father? It's through spiritual birth. And that's what the New Testament has brought into manifestation. Verse 7 says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, if there was no problems with it, then should no place have been sought for the second. But it did have fault. Remember, this is something that the Jews should have known because it was prophesied by Jeremiah back in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31 over in verse 31. Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, a brand new one not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, and they and, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. So this is a covenant where the word now is going to be written on the inside of them. And we go back to Hebrews chapter 8, and we see that this is exactly what Jesus brought into being. As we see from verse 7, we go to verse 8. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, as he's quoting from Jeremiah 31. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. So here he takes the word now and he's write it in our heart and mind. And he says, they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. This means now we can know the Lord and have revelation of him. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities or their lawlessness. This means, will I remember no more. He's going to wash all this away. All of our sins, all the lawlessness, he's going to remember no more. In that he saith the new covenant, he's made the first old. See, the old covenant couldn't do that. It could only cover over sin. It could never get rid of anything. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. We are not under the Old Covenant any longer. Speaking further about how Jesus could become a high priest, we go over to Hebrews chapter 7, and we see in verse 14, it makes a statement. It says, It is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So he couldn't be a priesthood under the Old Testament, because it didn't come from the tribe of Judah, it came from the tribe of Levi. We go back to verse 11, and he says this, If therefore perfection, which is what the New Testament will bring us into, were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron in that Levitical priesthood? No, there had to be a new order, and there had to be a new way also into the priesthood. Verse 12 says, For the priesthood being changed, it had to be changed. Just as the covenant was changed, the priesthood has been changed. It's made of also of necessity a change also of the law. There's also a change of the law. We're not under the law of the Old Testament anymore. 
you tell a lot of Christians that and they, they kind of get bent out of shape. But the truth is, we're not under the Old Testament law. We're under the New Testament law. Now, the New Testament law is a higher law. The Old Testament law was made for man after the flesh, with all of its fleshly ordinances and applications. The New Testament law is made for man after the spirit, who's born again with its spiritual applications. Everything now in the New Testament is operating according to the spirit. Now, you must understand that this, this about the priesthood was a prophecy how everybody was going to come into this priesthood back in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5 and 6, he said, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, keep my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the, all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. He's talking to all of the Israelites, all of the Jews. You'll, all of you are going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So, this was a prophecy for everybody. And this was going to come to pass when Jesus Christ came because Jesus was the first born from the dead out of spiritual death unto spiritual life, the cornerstone of the church. And he brought, this, brought us into this new priesthood that he established after the order of Melchizedek. We see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, you also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. There's a spiritual house now, not just a natural house. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Everything now is in the spirit, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, as contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. That's Jesus. Elect, precious, he that believeth on him shall not be confounded or put to shame, this means, Jesus the cornerstone. Unto you therefore which believe, he's precious, but unto them which be disobedient, or that did not obey, were not persuaded, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner. The Jews wouldn't receive it. Nonetheless, he established this house, the spiritual house of which Jesus is the cornerstone. A stone of stumbling and rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, they stumbled at the word, being disobedient whereunto also they were appointed. But then he says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that he would show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. You and I come out of darkness into the marvelous light when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. And we see that the work that Jesus has done in Revelation, Chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, from Jesus Christ, who's the faithful witness, and the firstborn, remember, he's the firstborn from the dead. Remember the word dead is plural, not singular, not talking about from death, but from the dead, where all the dead people were down in hell. The firstborn from the dead, he was born from spiritual death unto spiritual life. And he is the prince, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us, and he washed us from our own sins in his own blood. And he's made us kings and priests unto God. You and I are now come into this priesthood, and this priesthood makes everybody a king and a priest. You and I are kings and priests unto God. We are now in this position in the New Testament. And Jesus Christ is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Now this new law that we have, is a law that will bring forth victory. Romans 8, verse 2 says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. We're under a new law. The Old Testament could not bring life. It could only br brought the knowledge of sin and death. The wages of sin is death because it brought the knowledge of that. But the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is the New Testament law, has made us free now from the law of sin and death. And now we can walk in the ways of the Spirit in the New Testament and the laws of the Spirit and see us come into victory. It speaks of this as the perfect law of liberty, the law of the New Testament. James 1.25, whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, that's what the New Testament law is, and continues therein, he's a doer of it. 
He being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in his deed. And you and I will come into this. At the same time, we must understand that this same law that brings us liberty and brings us into these great promises also is what's going to judge us. James 2.12, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. It also will judge us as to whether we have walked right or not. So the way now into the priesthood has been shown forth through spiritual birth. It is now Jesus the one who came in and you and I come in the very same way. In fact, when it speaks of what Jesus accomplished for us, Colossians 1.15, he was the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every create creature, or it means creation. And we talked about in the fulfillment of the feasts how Jesus was on the cross on the very day of Passover. He went down to hell three days and three nights in fulfillment of unleavened bread, putting away the sin. And he was then born from the dead spiritually and came, then went up to heaven and poured out his blood in the mercy seat in fulfillment of the Feast of First Fruits. He's the firstborn of every creation, of all creation. He brought forth the new creation into being, which is what you and I get, come into when we're born again. And then it speaks about what he is. He's the head of the body, the church, who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, again, that's plural in the Greek, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So Jesus now is in this position. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the high priest. The way you come into it is by spiritual birth, which is, of course, what happens with us. How do you come into relationship with God, into this new priesthood, into covenant relationship, it's all by being born again. John 3.3, 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again. The word again means from above. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, down in verse 5, Jesus said, Except a man be born of water, which is physical birth, and of the spirit, which is spiritual birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This is how you come in to be a king in the kingdom so you can rule and reign. This is why it's mandatory for everybody to be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, physical birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit, that is spiritual birth from above. <coughs> this is why in verse 7, marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The word again, by the way, means from above. It's talking about a spiritual birth from above. Everybody must be born again to come into relationship. Now, when Jesus got born again, and when he did, the uh, first thing that he did as the high priest, when he was born again into that, is he went up to heaven. In John chapter 20, verse 17, here's where he appeared to Mary. And Jesus said to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Now, he's talking about him going up to heaven. And what did he do when he went up to heaven? In Hebrews, in chapter 9, it speaks of what he accomplished. Verse 11, Christ being come a high priest, he was born again to become a high priest of good things. Remember, first he made the covenant, then he got born again into that position of the high priest to come, a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And he had to go up there to pour his blood out on the mercy seat in heaven. We come down to verse 24. Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which were the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not, nor yet should he offer himself often as the high priest entered in the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, or the end of the age, hath appeared the end of the Old Testament age, and he brought the New Testament age into being, hath he put appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
He put it away. He accomplished this great work as the high priest, the first thing that he did. But as the high priest, now he has an ongoing ministry, which you must understand. Not only has he brought a new covenant, brought a new law, brought a new priesthood, brought a new way to come into it through spiritual birth, and also accomplished redemption. See, in our sins washed away, he has an ongoing work of ministry as a high priest now from the position of being enthroned as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brothers, brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He is full of mercy, and his mercy is available now for you and me, that we can come and receive the mercy of God, which is the love of God in action. And he's also faithful. He's faithful to perform the promises of the covenant. He's merciful and he's faithful. And you can absolutely trust in him to bring forth every promise in your life, as he's the one who performs this and sees it come to pass. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. It also speaks of him understanding everything that you would ever go through in life. Hebrews 4, 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling or affected by the feeling of our infirmities, our weaknesses, things that we have to deal with because we are in the flesh. We have a flesh that has not been changed. Sin dwells in the flesh. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Remember, Jesus had like sinful flesh. Romans 8, 3. Remember, he, had, he could be tempted. He had the ability to sin. But he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That means he's been through everything and anything that you've ever been through or ever will go through. So he can conquer everything when you look to him because he shows you the way to overcome all areas of sin in your life. He's already done it. In fact, he's been through everything and he is the forerunner for us who has entered in having accomplished everything and now he's in this position where he can minister for us because he's been through everything. Hebrews 6.20 whether the forerunner, speaking of Jesus, is for us entered. He's entered for us already in. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He was the forerunner. He's already done everything. He's already accomplished it all and brought us into this position now and as kings and priests and will bring us into everything that he has for us. He also is the one now who receives the tithes that we bring unto him. Hebrews 7, verse 8. Here men that die receive tithes in the natural. But there, that's a different place, he receiveth them of whom it's witness that he liveth. Who is it that's witness that he liveth has been raised from the dead? Jesus. Where is there? Where he's at, which is where? In heaven. Jesus in heaven receives the tithes and he sets them before the Father and we worship together when we bring the tithes unto the Father. But it comes through Jesus Christ, through He is the high priest, and He receives the tithes. And of course, then the blessings are going to be poured out upon you as you bring of the tithe, which is the tenth unto Him. He also is the one now carrying out the covenant promises to bring them to pass. Hebrews 8, 6, as we mentioned, He's obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he's the mediator of a better covenant established or enacted upon laws of better promises. That means you've got to follow the New Testament laws to see the promises come to pass. He has a more excellent ministry. And notice it speaks of him as the mediator. He is the mediator. A mediator is between two parties. And we see over in 1 Timothy chapter 2 what the mediator ministry is. 1 Timothy 2.5 There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He's still the man Christ Jesus. He has a glorified body. But he became a man. God and man united together, not just for a season, but forever. He's the man Christ Jesus. And he is the mediator between God and man. 
meaning that he is the one who works to bring man to, into relationship with, with God. He's the one who causes this reconciliation to come to pass. And how is that? Because you got to come through Jesus to get to the Father. That's why it says over in John chapter 14, Jesus said out of his own mouth in verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's no other way. There's no other way to get to the Father and get into relationship with him but by Jesus. He is the only way. He is the Savior of mankind. That's why everybody must receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior and get born again and you get a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. In fact, in Acts, it declares there's no other way you can do the, come into relationship. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. No other way of salvation. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We must. It's necessary. Absolutely necessary. No other way to come back into relationship with him. Jesus Christ is the mediator for the unsaved that they receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. They get born again. They come into relationship with the Father, coming back into that. He is the only way that this can be happening. And of course, what happens when they receive Jesus? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Remember, Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. You become a new creature or creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You are born from above. You get a brand new spirit. So the ministry of Jesus is he's the mediator for the unsaved to see them come into relationship with God. And it's through receiving Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Another aspect of his ministry is he is the intercessor. In Romans chapter 8, see when you and I pray now, in the New Testament, we pray to the Father <clears throat> in the name of Jesus, going through the high priestly ministry of Jesus. He is the intercessor when you pray. Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, he's at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. He's the intercessor. So, this is why, remember, in the New Testament, the change has come, and you must realize, John 16, verse 23, Jesus makes this statement. In that day, talking about the New Testament day, you shall ask me nothing. You don't pray to Jesus in the New Testament. Anybody who prays to Jesus, their prayer won't get above the ceiling. You don't pray to him. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, Whatsoever you shall ask the Father, now we pray to the Father. In my name, meaning we're coming through the high priestly ministry of Jesus in the name of Jesus. He will give it you. Jesus is the one who is the intercessor that when we pray, he takes that and he does something with the things that we pray or the things that we speak. Whenever you speak forth, he takes that and confesses that before the Father and it says that he, the Father is going to give it to you, but it's coming through the high priestly ministry of Jesus. We even see it referred to as intercessory ministry over in Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 25. Wherefore, he's able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God, that's talking about God the Father, by him, that's talking about Jesus, you come to the Father, by Jesus Christ, because you pray in the name of Jesus through the high priestly ministry, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He is there ready to make intercession on your behalf. Now notice, it doesn't mean he's automatically doing it. It says seeing he ever lives to make intercession for you, meaning he's there ready to make intercession. Well, how does his intercessory prayer go into operation? When you pray, it's not going to happen unless you pray. When you pray, you put his intercessory prayer into operation to bring forth the promises of God in your life. As he is going to speak that before the Father as the high priest, the intercessor on our behalf to see these things come to pass on our life. Another thing that we see 
is that Jesus is the heavenly attorney. What happens when you sin? Remember, now he washed away our sins, but now you and I were brand new, born again on the inside of us. Well, does that mean that you and I cannot sin? No, sin dwells in the flesh, doesn't it? If we walk after the flesh, we sin. We can also yield to it with our mind, our will, our emotions in the soulish realm. And that's walking contrary to God's word. Well, what do we do if we sin? Well, there's a way now for us to deal with that, of course, and it's all through Jesus' high priestly ministry. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our part is to confess our sins. When we do that, he, that's the Lord, is faithful. Remember, he's the faithful high priest. He's just or righteous to forgive us our sins, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He goes on in verse one, chapter 2, verse 1, says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. He didn't want us to sin. And remember, sin has no dominion over us. We don't have to sin. But if we do sin, well, there's, there's a remedy for this. There's a means to deal with this. If any man sin, we have an advocate. An advocate is the parakletos in the Greek, which really means one called alongside to help. And in this sense, it's like a heavenly attorney. We have a heavenly attorney that will come alongside to help in the situation. Because remember, what does Satan do? Satan is the accuser of the brethren that accuses us before God of our sins night and day. So, he's accusing us of our sins. We need someone to represent us. Amen. Who's that? Jesus. We have an advocate with the Father, a heavenly attorney, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the one that when we confess our sins, takes that, and then as we do that, the blood of Jesus is applied by Jesus that washes away our sins. It's all because of the heavenly advocate ministry of Jesus Christ as our heavenly attorney. Now, one thing we do need to know, if you walk in line with the word, he also keeps the blood applied that keeps you in relationship with God. The blood all has to do with relationship with God. It has nothing to do with conquering the enemy. That's a malign teaching. It all has to do with relationship with God. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from all sin. This means if we're walking in line with the word, it means we're not sinning. So... We're going to have fellowship with God and one another. And the blood, it says, cleanseth us. The word cleanseth is in the present tense, indicating ongoing, continuous action. Cleanses continually from all sin. It keeps us in that state. In other words, you walk in line with the word, the blood's applied, keeping you cleansed in that state. If you do sin, we got an advocate, a heavenly attorney, that now we can confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us and apply the blood and he'll wash away our sins away and we will be cleansed from all unrighteousness. And that's important because what is the effect of sin? Unrighteousness. Remember what it says in 1 John 5, verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin. So when we sin, it produces unrighteousness in us. And that's important to know because again, going back to chapter 1, verse 9, what will he do? He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means that unrighteousness will be eliminated from our life. This also brings us to another important point. Unrighteousness has to be eliminated from our life. And we as Christians can have unrighteousness when we sin. This also tells us something. When we're born again, are we perfectly righteous forever as people teach? No. It is a lying teaching. It is a false teaching. And we might just bring this to your attention for those of you who are not aware of this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, this appears that we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. But it's a mistake. There's mistakes in the translation here. When it says he hath made him to be sin, this word made, I put the cursor over it, means made. 
It's the Greek word poieo, which means make or made in the past tense. So the Father made Jesus to be sin for us, mankind, who knew no sin, speaking of Jesus, that we, mankind, might be made. Now, made, is that the same word? Let's look at it. It's not the same word. It's a different word. It's the word ginomai, which means become. So that makes a big difference. Big difference between whether you're made something or whether you can become something. If made, it's already done. If become, it's not done yet. That we might become the righteousness of God. And this is a present tense, so it would be better translated may become if the ongoing necessity, the necessary conditions are met. The reason I say that is present tense means continuous ongoing action. This also happens to be a subjunctive mood verb. That is important. The subjunctive mood in the Greek expresses things contrary to fact that are conditional upon conditions being met. In other words, the statement that we may become the righteousness of God is a conditional statement, not based on what's already been done by Jesus. It's a conditional statement on what you and I do because we must walk in line with the word of righteousness so that we are righteous before him. And this is to be an ongoing work of its present tense, that we may become in an ongoing manner righteousness if we meet the conditions. This is why the advocate ministry is very important. You and I must confess our sins. Don't let yourself abide in sin. You're abiding in unrighteousness. You cannot be abiding in unrighteousness. You need to confess your sins and get cleansed from that unrighteousness so you are right with the Lord. And not only when he does this about the forgiveness of our sins, we read this earlier, but let's go back to this. When he forgives us of our sins, Hebrews 8, verse 12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. This is the Greek word anomia, meaning lawlessness. Their sins and their lawlessness will I remember no more. Not only does he cleanse us from unrighteousness, he doesn't even remember them anymore. It's as if it never happened. They're gone. I mean, they're, they're, they're eliminated. God doesn't even know what you're talking about if you bring up past sins because he, they've already been washed away. And when they're cleansed, he does not remember them anymore. That's a tremendous promise. They didn't have that one in the Old Testament. They had a constant remembrance of them. You should have no more conscience of sins. We see this also declared here in Hebrews 10, verse 1 and 2. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, all the Old Testament law, this is speaking of, was pointing towards all the good things to come in the New Testament, types and shadows. Not the very image of the things. It didn't bring them into manifestation. Can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there too perfect because the New Testament will bring us into perfection. See? Well, verse 2. For then would they have not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Now that didn't happen in the Old Testament. It was only a covering over the sins. But in the New Testament, it's a cleansing and a washing away of our sins. They're gone. God does not even remember them anymore. You must understand that. The sins are washed away. That's why. Don't ever let the devil bring condemnation or guilt upon your sins, past sins. You're giving place to the enemy if you do so. Because, Romans 8, verse 1, there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you're walked in after the Spirit, in line with the Word, you're walking in the light. And the blood of Jesus Christ keeps you cleansed. And, is there any, does he remember your sins? No, they're not remembered anymore. There's no condemnation any longer. Now, if you walk after the flesh, you sin, then you will be under the condemnation because of the sin. That's why, of course, we've got to confess our sins and walk in line with the word. Another aspect of his ministry is he is the guarantor that the promises will come to pass. And you need to know this. You need to know that all the promises of God that God has given. He guarantees that they will come to pass. It says, when you meet the conditions, that is. 
Hebrews 7, verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety. This really refers to one who is the guarantee of a better testament. The surety is like we have our insurance companies, or guarantee companies, or surety companies, they call them. And essentially, in the policy, they're guaranteeing and assuring you that they will pay such and such, you know, under this contract that you've made with them in an insurance policy. So they are the guarantor or the surety, the assurance of this better <laughs> testament that he is going to bring these promises to pass. Now, remember, you've got to meet the, the terms, though. You've got to do your part. I mean, the promises won't automatically come to pass unless you meet your part. There's two parties to a covenant. You and I have our part to play, and then God has his part to play, but he watches over his word to perform it. In fact, we even see Isaiah. God's always, of course, been one who performs his word. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God will watch over his word, and he will absolutely accomplish it. And the scripture that we were just referring to, it's out of Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12, where he watches over his word to perform it. Jeremiah 1, 12. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten. The word hasten means to watch, or be wake or be watch of, or be wake, wakeful over, to watch over my word to perform it. You have to have confidence. Because of the ministry of Jesus, he watches over the word to perform it because he is the surety. He is the guarantor of the covenant. In fact, Jesus even made the statement, everything that he speaks is going to come to pass because he's the guarantor bringing it to pass. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. They'll all come to pass because everything he speaks, he makes sure it comes to pass as he brings it into manifestation. So he's the guarantor. You meet your conditions, God will bring the promises to pass. You need to believe, never doubt, know that God will bring the promises to pass as you do what is necessary. Now that involves overcoming the enemy, of course casting out the demons, using your authority to stop his works, as well as to speak forth his word, walking in line with his word, praying the word, taking hold of the promises with your faith. All these things are our responsibility. That's the conditions that you and I have to see him perform his word. Another thing that we see Jesus is Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. We see in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, When the chief shepherd shall appear, well, that's when Jesus comes back, he shall receive, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. We're going to be crowned when he comes back. We talked about the crowns that are going to come to us in the past message uh, about when he comes back at the second coming and we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to get a crown and we're going to be rewarded according to what we, we have done. Now, our, the shepherd, what does a shepherd do? The shepherd watches over the flock, doesn't he? He tends the flock, he herds the flock, he guards the flock, he protects the flock, he guides the flock, he leads them and guide them in the way, he watches over them. That's exactly what Jesus does for you and me. In John chapter 10, we see in verse 14, Jesus makes the statement, I am the good shepherd. He's a good one. And know my sheep. And I'm known of mine. He knows those who are sheep. Now, this also implies what's going to bring the shepherding ministry into operation. Well, you've got to be a sheep. If you're a goat wandering off, is he shepherding over the goats? No, because they're not following him. He shepherds over the sheep. And the sheep, have you ever seen sheep out in the field? They're right on the heels of the shepherd. They go whichever way he goes. So you must be a sheep if you're going to see the shepherd ministry of Jesus come into manifestation to guard you, to protect you, to guide you, to lead you, to watch over you in your life. So, he says, I'm the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and I'm known of mine. That means you're to know him. You're to know him. So this implies that you develop a personal, intimate fellowship with him. You know him. I'm known of mine. 
So this means you draw an eye to him, you, he draws an eye to him. You get his word in you, you be, begin to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with the Lord, and you know him. We see in verse 16, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. They shall hear my voice, there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And that's right. Of course, that's talking about all those who will come and you're born again in the future. All the rest of the sheep, which you and I are, we hear in his voice, one fold, one shepherd. And the, as the shepherd of the sheep, you and I are to be so close to him that we hear his voice so he can lead us and guide us and direct us and show us what to do and warn us when there's danger. We want to be led by him in everything we do. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them, he knows them, and they follow me. If you're a real sheep, you're going to be following him. That implies you're going to be a doer of the word. Because when he hear, you, hear, you hear him, that means he's speaking to you. So you hear his voice. You're taking hold of what he says. And following him means that you are going to be a doer of the word. So the great shepherd is the one who watches over the one who's a sheep walking closely with him, seeking after him, has a personal intimate fellowship with him, hears his voice, hears the word, is a follower, is a doer of the word. Those are the ones that are going to see this great shepherd ministry come forth in their life. We go over to 1 Peter 2, verse 25. You were as sheep going astray, that's before we came to the Lord, but are now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. The bishop means an overseer. This word episcos, episcopos means an overseer, one who's overseeing your soul. So he's the shepherd who's going to lead and guide, direct, watch over. He's overseeing your soul as well, like a superintendent over your soul. So as you get close to the Lord, he's going to watch over every aspect of your life to make sure He's, his word will always come to you to show you what to do if you get in the word and you're spending time in the presence of God and you're drawing nigh to him. He's going to watch over your soul so your soul will make the right choice. Another thing that we see, he is the head of the church and you and I are to follow in his ways. Colossians 1.18, he's the head of the body of the church, is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. In all things that he might have the preeminence, he is to have the preeminence to be first place. we got to put him first place in our life. If we don't put him first place in our life, then we're really not following him. We aren't really sheep. We aren't really submitted unto him because he's the head of the body. And that tells us also we are all a body. We are members of a body. You're important in the body of Christ. We're all tied together as a body with Jesus being the head of the body. We see this referred to as him the head over the church in Ephesians 1, verse 22. He's put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Jesus is the head over everything. And how do we follow his way? The word, because Jesus is the word. That's why the word of God must be first place in our life. Also, we see the picture of what his ministry does as the great shepherd in Psalms 23. Psalms 23. Psalms 23. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. He must be your shepherd. You can't be going in other directions. I shall not want. The first thing, he's going to meet all your needs. You're not going to want. You're not going to lack. He's the God who will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory when we do the things that he said. He will bless us. No lack. The lack comes from the devil. God brings abundance. He brings every one of your needs to be met. What else does a shepherd do? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Green pastures is the place where there is prosperity and provision, where you're going to be fed the things of God. He makes you to lie down in green pastures. He's going to bring forth his prosperity. He will bless the work of your hands. He's prospered. He's promised to prosper us. He wants you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. You need to prosper in all areas so God can prosper at the work of your hands. He leads me beside the still waters. That's peace. Still would be resting place. 
God's going to always lead you in the path of possessing the promises of God, entering into having peace, and also to enter into the rest that he has for us. We see in verse 3, he restores my soul. He comes to bring restoration to your soul, hurts, wounds, damaged emotions, problems in your mind, things that have occurred. He comes to renew your mind. He comes to heal your mind, heal your soul, restore you, deliver you. This is why you cast the demons out of the soulless realm in order to be set free. You take hold of his healing. He comes to heal your soul. And how does your soul get messed up? Because of sin. Psalms 41 says, heal my soul for I've sinned. You sin and you cause problems in the soul. Well, he's coming to heal your soul and restore it. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Everything that he does will always direct you in line with the word of righteousness. He never does anything that's unrighteous. He never does anything contrary to his word. So he's always going to direct you in the paths of the word of God because you must be righteous before him if you're going to see him manifest in your life. Verse 4, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. We're not to be afraid of anything. The valley of the shadow of death is in this world where we have the enemy who is operating with all the evil spirits and all the sin and all the filth that goes on. We're in the valley of the shadow of death, but we will fear no evil. God does not want you to be afraid of anything. You're going to believe. You're going to trust in him. You're going to have faith. For thou art with me. The Lord's with you. That's why you should never fear. And how is he with you? Thy rod, which is the type of Jesus, the word, and thy staff, which is a type of the Holy Spirit, who is the one, the comforter, the one who supports us, they comfort me. Notice you have two comforters. You have Jesus, the Word, and you have the Holy Spirit, who's come to dwell in you, to teach you, to lead you, to guide you, to direct you. We also see in verse 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, a table of blessing. God's blessings will come upon you even in the presence of all the demons all around. They're all over the place. If your eyes are open to the realm of the Spirit, the devils are everywhere, and the enemies are here. Nonetheless, God's table of blessing will come upon you even in the presence of your enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, that's the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon you. There's an anointing from the Spirit of Christ and from the Holy Spirit coming upon you, and through the anointing of the Holy Spirit and His manifestation, He will accomplish His great work to bring healing, to bring deliverance, to, to lead you and guide you in the ways you're to go. My cup runneth over. That's the blessings are going to come on you and they're going to overtake you and you're going to run over with blessings. Blessings are going to come upon you. This is all because you make him your shepherd. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's what the shepherd will do. That means you shouldn't have been evil things following you. If you're walking with the Lord and doing what he says, goodness and mercy is going to follow you. It's going to catch you every place you go. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You're going to abide in him. You're going to dwell in that very presence of the Lord. This is the great shepherd ministry to every single one of us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. He says this, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus the great shepherd, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. This is the other aspect of the shepherd ministry. He's going to make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. God's going to make you perfect in every good work. And you're going to, to do his will. You have a part to play to do his will. He'll be working in you that which is well-pleasing in sight. That means if you put him first place and you do what the Word says and you're a doer of the Word, God will accomplish the work in you. And this is what he will bring forth. One other aspect of the high priestly ministry of Jesus that we need to talk about is that he is the high priest of our confession, what we speak with our mouth. Hebrews 3.1 Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, we are, we're considered holy brethren before the Lord, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession. That means that he's going to do something with our profession. The word profession is homologio, which is the same word translated confession. Also in scripture, it's translated profession or confession. So when you and I profess or confess and speak God's word, 
the high priest, Jesus, is going to do something with it. And that is important for you to understand. This is why, of course, you want to continually hold fast speaking the word. Look at what it says in Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then we have a great high priest that's passed into heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Well, whenever you see this statement, this is talking about something that he's going to do then. So we're talking about his ministry. Let us hold fast our profession. Continually hold fast though speaking forth the confessing, the professing of the word of God. You're to continually do this because this word hold fast is a present tense verb. Otherwise, you continually keep speaking. And by the way, in order to bring this high priestly ministry into operation, it's not automatic. It is a subjunctive mood verb, which is a conditional statement, which more literally you could translate it as Young's brings out, may we hold fast the confession continually, or the profession continually, conditional upon you and me doing it. Because when you speak the word, you are bringing into operation the high priestly ministry of Jesus involving your confession. If you quit speaking the word, you stop his ministry from working because you continually hold fast this professing, confessing, speaking of the word of God. And why are we doing that? Because we are going to bring the promises into being and we're going to put the angels in operation. Matthew chapter 10 verse 32 and 33 tell us this. Whosoever shall confess me, Jesus is the word, so you're confessing the word before men. What happens when you confess the word? Jesus is the high priest of our confession. He does something with it. Him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. In other words, Jesus takes that which we confess and he confesses us and that which we're speaking before the Father. But also, you must understand, whosoever shall deny me before men, how would we deny him before men if we're speaking things contrary to what his word says? We're denying him. We're denying the word. Him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. I mean, he's just. He's not going to just confess you before the Father when you speak right and when you speak wrong, you know, say, well, I'm not going to be any effect. Not so. You're going to be denied before the Father, and he's not going to be able to do anything for you. See, it's not automatic. Also, Luke tells us another thing in Luke chapter 12. And why does he bring it up to the Father? Because the Father is the one who performs the word. Remember, you pray to the Father, and he said, he will give it unto you. The Father is the one who sends these things forth to you, the promises. Luke chapter 12, verse 8, also tells us about the angels put in operation. Look what it says. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. So when we speak the word, it's also Jesus takes that word and he confesses it before the angels. What do the angels do? They go forth to perform the word. This is one of the ways that you put the angels in operation. But also, the same thing is true in verse 9. He that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Do the angels automatically operate for you because you're a Christian? No. You have to put them in operation. If you speak contrary to the word, you're going to, the, you're going to be denied before the angels. That means the angels stop and they can't do anything more for you because you haven't put them in operation. Remember, we're in a covenant relationship and you have a part to play to put them in operation. And what are these angels doing, by the way? Hebrews 1.14 speaks about the angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? Who are the heirs of salvation? You and I are. What do the angels do? They minister for us, the heirs of salvation. And what do they do? They bring the promises into being on our behalf. Psalms 103. Psalms 103. In verse 20, it tells us, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel, this means they're strong and mighty, in power, this is a word koak, meaning manifest power, they're strong and mighty in manifesting power, they do his commandments, hearkening to the voice of the word. So, what do the angels do? First of all, you can't just speak whatever you want and think the angels are going to do something. They only do the word. 
They do His commandments. You can't put them in operation to go do something for you that's contrary to the Word. You're going to do the commandments. You're going to hearken to the voice. They're going to hearken to the voice of the Word as you're, you're doing the commandments or speaking them forth. So as you do them, then the angels will carry these out on your behalf. One other thing you want to know about how to put angels in operation, not only by you speaking or confessing God's Word, but also... Look what Jesus said. You can actually put these angels in operation by praying directly to the Father, which Jesus will confess you before the Father, for him to send angels, the Father to send angels to you. Look what it says in Matthew 26, 53. This is when Jesus was in the garden. He gave himself into their hands, but he made this statement that he didn't have to be given himself into their hands. Otherwise, he could have dealt with that situation when, you know, when Judas came with a band of soldiers. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? A, a legion of angels with 6,826 soldiers, so we're talking about 80,000 angels coming on the scene. So apparently from, he must have had revelation that that would have been enough to deal with all the demons that were driving all these people. So you can pray to the Father, and he will give you all the angels that are necessary in order to deal with the situation that you're dealing with. And that's where you pray to the Father and thank Him for sending forth the angels to do things. We pray this on all kinds of things all the time. And angels work to accomplish these things, to perform the Word of God. And you must understand, angels go into operation from the first time you speak the Word. That's important for you to understand. Don't think because you haven't seen something happen that they're not working. <coughs> Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, where Daniel was praying for 21 days. This is when the angel showed up. He said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Notice, he was the coming. What happened? How come it took him 21 days? Well, because there was a battle going on in the realm of the spirit. The prince of the kingdom of Persia, an evil principality serving the devil, withstood me 21 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So the angels will go into operation immediately. They may not come on the scene. You might not see the manifestation of something yet, but they're working in the realm of the spirit. So the high, high priestly confession, uh, a, a confession of Jesus, that his ministry is that when you pray and or speak the word, he takes, Jesus takes that as a high priest, confesses it before the Father for the release of the promises, and also confesses it before the angels in order for the angels to go into operation for the performance of it. Now, in the area of prayer, by the way, you're confessed before the Father, but remember there's another aspect of what you do. The Father's going to give it to you because you take hold of it. Remember, you have to pray a prayer of faith, believe you take hold of it, and speak it into being that's also another aspect to see the promises come to pass in your life. So just because you prayed a prayer, that's not the end of it. You pray the prayer when you bring the Word of God, Jesus takes that, confesses it before the Father, then you take hold of that from the Father in order to release that promise, that's the prayer of faith, believe you take hold of it to speak it into being, that releases that to come to pass on your behalf. That's important to understand when you're praying the Word, accurate New Testament prayer and confessing the word accurately and speaking these promises into being. That's why you keep speaking and holding fast and speaking things into being until they come to pass. So we see that Jesus now is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's ruling over the church. He's the head of the church. He's also the mediator for the unsaved. He's the intercessor for the believer. He's the advocate, the heavenly attorney for when you sin. He's the surety and the guarantor that the word will work every time and be performed. The promises will come to pass in your life when you meet the conditions. And he's the great shepherd, the sheep protecting, watching over you, guarding you, guiding you, leading you. Also the, uh, the high priest of the confession. He takes what you speak, sends it to the Father. You take hold of that promise then from the Father and also confesses it before the angels that go forth to perform the word and they will bring the promises to pass because the angels are the ones who minister for you and me, the heirs of salvation. 
So praise God for the high priestly ministry of Jesus. And you've got to be aware of this. Because whenever you do something, you've got to, got to know Jesus is going to go into operation for you as you are praying directly to the Father. But you need to understand that so you have faith and understand how this New Testament works now. It always works through Jesus in the high priestly position doing something with what you're acting upon of the Word of God in your life, whether it's prayer, intercession, when you're praying for others to in intercede, you know, or when you're praying for others to be born again. He's at work to bring them to the place of receiving Jesus. He's the mediator for the unsaved. So this is why you need to understand his ministry, what he does, how he does things, and what causes things to happen. When you act upon the Word, know and have faith in the, in the ministry of Jesus, just like it said, seeing we have this high priest, hold fast your confession. If you know he's up there, you'll keep speaking the Word. If you forget he's up there or you don't understand this, you won't be speaking the Word. You'll quit and you'll just shut him down from working and wonder why the promise didn't come to pass. No, you hold fast speaking it. You continue to put his ministry in operation and also when you pray and confess your sins, be sure you receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness so that you are cleansed from all unrighteous and right with the Lord. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the present ministry of Jesus Christ, who is the high priest of the covenant, the new covenant relationship. I thank you that I understand I enter into a covenant through birth. I enter into the priesthood through birth. Spiritual birth brings me into the new covenant relationship, being born from above, just as Jesus was born from the dead. I've been born from spiritual death unto spiritual life. And now that I am in Christ, I've come into the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek because I'm a king and I am a priest. And I put in operation the high priestly ministry of Jesus, who is merciful and faithful. He's been through everything. He was tempted in all points, yet without sin. He receives my tithes, so the blessings come upon me in my life. And I'm going to put his ministry in operation as the mediator for the unsaved the intercessor, to see the prayers be brought into manifestation, the advocate, so that when I confess my sins, I know that he forgives me and cleanses me from all unrighteousness, that he's the guarantor, the surety of performing the promises of the New Testament, the great shepherd of the sheep who will lead me, guard me, protect me, guide me, watch over me, and accomplish his word in my life to bring me to the place of perfection in doing his will. I also know he's the high priest of my confession. As I speak forth, praying the word, confessing the word, I put him in operation. He takes that what I speak, confesses it before the Father, confesses it before the angels, and they will perform the word and bring it to pass. I thank you that I'm going to put the high priestly ministry of Jesus in operation all times in my life as I am doing the word of God in the New Testament. Thank you for the New Testament. Thank you. I have a free approach to the Father in the name of Jesus, through the high priestly ministry. And I know that everything will be performed according to the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. When you understand this, you understand what Jesus is doing. You're going to, put it, you're going to see this be put in operation. Also, you'll quit praying to Jesus, because that won't do you any good. And you'll understand you're praying to the Father, but you also understand what Jesus' part is in the performance of the new covenant to bring all these things to pass. And when you do this, you'll see it come to pass in your life. Praise God for the truth of the Word of God 
and the high priestly ministry of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We rejoice in the truth of the Word of God and the revelation that we see in the Word of the high priestly ministry of Jesus. We got a high priest with a better covenant, with better promises. And Father, as we walk in line with your Word and do exactly what your Word says, we'll see all of these things come to pass in our life and see the full ministry of Jesus Christ, our high priest, work on our behalf to bring forth every promise into manifestation. Thank you. We'll be hearers and doers of this word, and we will see the high priestly ministry of Jesus working every day in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're going to continue to...